Today, Lord, with humble heart, we come to your presence to prepare a little bit more in the spirit of Lent to the celebration of the mysteries of our own salvation. Today, we come to you with prayer, asking that you send the Holy Spirit to give good, to give good lights, to provide for us all the nurturement that we need to get better spiritual life. Repeat with me, my Lord, I believe, I believe, but may I believe more firmly. I hope, but may I hope more securely. I love, but may I love more ardently. Dear Jesus, I adore you. As my first beginning, I long for you as my last end. I praise you as my constant benefactor, and I invoke you as my gracious protector. By your wisdom, direct me. By your, By your righteousness, restrain me. Restrain. By, your By your indulgence, console me. Console me. By, your power, By your power, protect me. Protect me. Glory, be Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. World without end. Amen. Please be seated. Well, first of all, thanks for coming late night. I always consider a, as a priest that used to be a young man, I also was having a good time in life. I, I sometimes like think to myself, what if I was not the priest and I was invited to something like this? Should I come? <laughs> and I think to myself, mm, you can send me the notes. So I admire that you make a little uh, of effort, and I praise God, and I pray that I will have the same spirit. In the meantime, I'm the priest, so I have to be here, right? <laughs> no, I'm very happy to be here, by the way. So today, we would like as a parish to mark the path that we are walking together in order to get to Holy Week. In the past Sunday, I was given an exercise that it was very simple, but it makes a connection to what we are doing. And it, it was to remember each Sunday. Do you remember? Yes or no? So what was the gospel of the first Sunday of Lent? The temptations. We were telling the temptations of Jesus. So he receives baptism and then he goes to the desert for... 40 days. Then he goes to the mission, right? The next Sunday, what was it? Uh-uh. Mm-mm. That's the one coming. You're already one Sunday later. <laughs> huh? It depends. If it was with the catechumens, it was the Samaritan woman. Mm -mm. What was the last Sunday, the next Sunday? Come on, people. Huh? Transfiguration. Hmm? Huh? Ah? Transfiguration. No, transfiguration. Are you sure? Yes. I'm testing you. Yes. I'm the priest, I know. But I'm just trying to make you suffer a little bit. Oh. Uh-uh. No, no, no. No. You're in another church. <laughs> okay, so the first one, we were telling the... Uh, the temptations. Then, after the temptations, you're totally right then. But I need you to assure it. We were telling of transfiguration. Then, the third Sunday, what were we sharing? It was the path of life. And it was a gospel telling how to act, how to respond, to be ready, not to improve, improvise your life. 
So why am I mentioning those three Sundays? And now the Sunday that it's coming, that it is, now you can say it, the prodigal son. If you review, every Sunday it's marking one of the examples of Lent. And not only Lent, it is marking the examples of life. How do you enter to church? By baptism. How is the Lord entering his mission? He goes to the river Jordan and enters then mm, to the baptism. And after that, he goes to the desert. You remember? What is life? Life, it is compared like a desert, right? You are having needs, you are having problems, you are having conditions, situations, but you are also in a connection with God. And how life is tested? What were the temptations of Jesus? Huh? The temptations of power, the temptations of heaven, and the temptations of flesh. of flesh. So, is your life tested by that? Yes or no? In daily basis, even. You just start celebrating something, and then you will be tested on that. Huh? Oh, I feel so humble. Hmm, wait, right? Because you're going to be tested. And the little dragon that you thought you defeated, coming back. It seems like life. Lord Jesus was also tested on that. So baptism and life, passing life. What is transfiguration then? We're walking the three Sundays, you see? What is transfiguration then? Knowing where are we heading. So the Lord, before heading to the crucifixion, Peter, James, and who else? And John, they go with him. For what? To see the glory of God. Why do they need to see that glory? Because later they are going to see Jesus in very bad shape. Hmm? All whipped and destroyed and all bloody. And it seems like he is no God in that moment of crucifixion. But they remember. They remember. We saw him in the transfiguration. So the Lord is giving to them what is to come. So let us make the connection for this Lent once again with those three Sundays. Those three Sundays, they are marking a path of life. The path of entering to life with the grace of God, the baptism. The Sunday that is marking the life that we have, that it is submitting to many of the temptations, but also to a lot of joys and graces, because we cannot walk in life like, oh, when is this life going to end? It is so hard. Don't worry. You're going to be happy when you go to heaven. But down here, you're going to be miserable. Huh? No, you cannot walk life like that. You need to walk your life knowing where are you headed. Knowing where are you heading. That is transfiguration. Last Sunday that I was also here preaching, I was remembering the example of the babies. When they go to a park, to an amusement park, how do they behave one week before the day of actually heading to the amusement park? Huh? Huh? Yeah. They are counting the days. They put the calendar in the fridge. One, two, three, because they know the day, right? How are they eating, dreaming, handling things the days before? Let's say that they are heading to Disney, for example. Huh? They sleep with Mickey, they eat with Trivolin, they talk to Goofy, the bed is all set with a the, with the, uh, picture of Donald Duck. Why? Because they know. They know where they're headed, and they like that place. In Christian life, there's also a Lent exercise, and that is the proposal also of that transfiguration, knowing where are we heading? Or even more, more than knowing where we're heading, maybe we could say knowing to whom you belong, right? Knowing to whom you belong. Do you actually realize that you are a member of the family of God? Hmm? Or maybe sometimes you see, you check yourself at the mirror and you don't even believe it yourself. Huh? You're just like, mm, poor me, not going to make it. Huh? Oh, I'm always like this. No, we need to shake a little bit, not only the body, but also the soul, and make that step, knowing that we know where we're heading. Three Sundays. The Sunday that it's coming in Lent, 
Now it is going to be the opportunity in life that we have with the example of the prodigal son. What happens with the prodigal son? You remember the adventure. It is a story of Jesus. So one of the kids comes to daddy. Daddy, I need my inheritance. I would like to go have fun. The world, it is so nice, and I want to go check it out. What happens with the father? In that gospel, the father, God the father, by the way, it is allowing your free will. The father is not telling the kid like, hmm, loser, huh? you need for your dad to die, then I'll give you the inheritance, right? Huh? Or you have to work more before checking the world. No, the father says right away, have Here's your health. Go do what you want with your will. It resembles life. Yes or no? Yes. Hmm? Are you free? Yes. Really? Okay. So the kid, he goes, and in a life of dissension, says the Bible, he uses all the fortune. And later, that Sunday presents the son coming back to his senses. That is the clue word of that gospel. There's a moment that it is before and after the decision of heading back to the father. And that is called by coming back to his senses. So he reviews his life. I already had a life that I thought that it was okay. But the people working for my father, they are in better shape. I need to go back. I need to start walking back. I know that I don't deserve it says the prodigal son. Even he says, I will tell to my father, do not treat me like one of your sons. Treat me like one of your slaves, right? Says the gospel. So that gospel of the next Sunday, it is marking their return. But maybe the prodigal uh, son shouldn't be called like that. Instead of that, maybe that Sunday could be called the good father. The good father instead of the prodigal son. Why? Because now, with this land time, we discover how the heart of God works. So review that gospel. What happens? The father is checking that the son, it's coming back. The old man was waiting for the kid to come to his senses and come back. He was checking on the window. I can imagine him with a little bit of tea, Right and checking mm, another day. Where's this kid? But it is with full of love, waiting for him. When he sees the kid, instead of hmm, wait for him huh, to enter the house, I have the right whip. Right, right, loser. Huh? Instead of that, the father goes to him. Huh? It is a gospel of God getting close to us. So it is not your decision that I decided to love God, but it is actually God who made the first decision to love you and to love you even in the time that we didn't deserve to be loved because of our own decisions of preferring the sinful life. So he goes to the kid and he provides all the honor and all the elements that bring him back to the level of sun. So you will have the finest linen. You will receive the ring that identifies you as a member of the family. And you will have your sandals because you have dignity. So you don't need to touch the soil with your own feet. The father is giving those elements to him. And it is an embrace. It is the embrace that God is giving to all of us knowing that we have the opportunity to do it. Think like this. Do you think that God loses time? Hmm? Like, okay, I know that every single one of you is going to hell. So, uh, but I, I'll have fun with you a little bit. Do we picture God like that? No. God knows that you're capable of a good life. God knows that you have the capacities to love even to the extreme levels that you don't even or that you are not even suspicious of huh? you review the life of the martyrs let's touch one for example do you remember the life of that priest maximilian colby do you remember how he dies tell me 
He's a martyr. So how he dies? He changes places with another person that was a, a prisoner in Auschwitz, in, in Germany, during the Second World War. So in those camps, if one escapes, ten die. That was the rule of, that, of those campaments. So one made it out, one escapes, and now we're going to kill ten. So the priest, Maximilian, I'm trying to bring the example of extreme love, he realizes that one that is going to die, he is the father of four. And that he has the need to be able to survive that camp, to answer for his family. So the priest, he changes places. He raises the hand, yes, what do you want? I would like to exchange place with that prisoner. Why? I'm a Catholic priest. He says that, I'm a Catholic priest. That's what I need to do. He exchanges places. How could he do something like that? Because of what God knows that we are capable of. So it is a rejection of life. I don't like my life. Let's kill myself. No, it is a passion. The passion of being connected to God. If God was able to give his life for me and for you, why am I not going to give my life also for him? That it is the call by the way of a priest. Now that a priest is talking to you, what is the priest missing in life? Why a priest is doing that? What am I missing? I'm missing wife. I'm missing family, children. Those things are nice. Yes or no? Sometimes, right? But most of the time they are very nice, right? What else am I missing? The capacity to create my own business, to make money, to travel, hmm? to know the world, to have fun in many ways and many things. I'm missing things like that. Why? Because of that expression of love. How can you do it, Father? Huh? I remember one person coming to me and telling, t saying to me, Oh, Father, I wouldn't be able to do what you do ever, right? He says that to me with the ever very well marked, like ever, right? And I told him, pretty sure you're not able, my friend, but I can. God gave me that and I'm able to offer that life. Why? Because of that extreme love that he has for us. Now, am I perfect? Do I fly like an angel already and candles follow with me and you're doing novenas to me? No, almost, almost is a good word, <laughs> but I'm not in that level, my friends, I'm not in that level, so why God is making a choice of a sinful person to guide you? Because I understand you, I know what are the fights, I know how to handle life also, and now I'm committing myself, my life, to be able to serve you. So the examples that I'm giving in here, it is to discover the things that the land time they are offering. And it is for you to step up, to move yourself to a level that God is expecting and he knows that you can do it. So I would like to touch today then, for Lent, the three most important words of Christianism. What are those three words? No. No. What? No. No. The, no. <laughs> the three most important words of Christianity. What is the mystery that we believe? That is Lent. Exactly. Say it again. Passion. Death. And resurrection. Those three words, they are marking the opportunity for us to go back to God. Without those three, we don't have open gates. We are just stuck down here, not able to do the things to open those doors. Because think like this. What do you have that you can offer God to pay for your sins and make him open the gate so you enter heaven? What can you offer? What? Hmm? You're going to give to God your good looks? 
He looks better than you. So, are you going to offer money? Money doesn't work up there. What are you going to give? Intelligence? I think he's more intelligent than you. What are you going to offer? Could be your sins. Yes. What are we going to offer to him? We are going to offer what he desires. What he desires. So what is that? He made a decision. And that is the first word that I want to touch in this retreat of Lent. We said passion, death, and resurrection. So the first word, passion. Passion comes from also the word being passionate. To be a passionate of something. So the passion of the Christ, think like this, it is not only the bloody scene that you see. Oh, he was all whipped uh, and full of marks in his body. That's the passion of the Christ. Mm -mm. That is not the passion of the Christ. That is the suffering of the Christ. What is the real passion in there? Exactly. Why is he doing that for us? Because he loves you and he wants to set you free. That it's the passion of the Lord. And he has such a passion that God himself decided to leave heaven to enter earth through the yes of a woman. The verb, the word of God became fleshed and dwell among us. He decided to leave heaven to enter this world. I will ask you something more. What's better, heaven or down here? Heaven is better. Do you understand now how uh, he's loving you, right? He leaves something that is better to be close to you, to understand you. That it's a passion. Now, maybe we could understand that word a little bit more with the examples of daily life. What do you have passion for? Huh? So let's make uh, something that it, it could be like the beginnings of a family. Do you remember the passion that you had for the woman that now is your wife? Do you remember the beginnings? That it's a passion. So what happened? You were one day walking and then you feel that there's something different. And you saw the woman. And you said to yourself, oh, mine, huh? that's mine. The passion starts. So now what's the next step? I need to get the number. I need to check the friends. I need to know where she works. I need to talk to her to realize what it's her thinking. I need to know from what country she's coming because I also love culture. You develop a passion, right? Then, finally, when you start talking to her, you start to finally shower in yourself, right? Finally getting a better dressing. Now you're getting the good cologne, right? Because you need to smell right. So the woman, oh, you smell so nice. Yes, right? Huh? Why are you doing that? She's making the creepy face like, oh, you need a boyfriend. <laughs> So, back to that. Why are you doing all that? Because you have a passion. You have a passion. You love that woman. And it works the other way around. Even if women, they don't want to recognize it. But, oh, interesting. Uh -huh. uh, I'm going to lashes here, right? Uh, I'm going to go get my tan, you know. And, uh, man. It works both ways. Why? Passion. Passion. So, the Lord himself, he also has a passion. And it is the passion that he created you. You belong to him. And God, in that, he is very greedy, if we can use that word with him. He doesn't like to share you with anybody else. Not the devil, not the world, not the flesh. No, why? Because he wants you for him. Why? Because God is the only thing that we have and nothing else? No, because he is the life. He gave you that expression. And if you want to feel alive, you need to connect to the source of all life. I am the life. 
I am the way and I am the truth. Do we understand that first point? So the Lord, it is having a passion. When it's that passion ending, well, that passion will end when the world closes, when the last human being, it is presented to God. And we finally are able to tell all this adventure, it was worth it, but let's close. Huh? Heaven and earth will pass, but not his word. Until that point, there is a passion. Now, moving from the word passion, now we enter the word death. And it is a manifestation of that passion. Think like this. God created the entire universe just by pronouncing. He has the power for that. The elements, they obey him. He says, let it be the sun. And the sun comes to existence. That is the power that God has. So, redemption could have happened it just by words. Of course, he could have said, human beings, I forgive you of your, of your transgressions. Come back. And that's it. He could have done it like that. But where is the manifestation of his passion? In just saying that. Huh? It is like the life of married people. It is enough that I tell you that I love you, my dear wife. Mm -mm. It has to come with deeds, actions, and words, right? So the husband comes on Sunday with the breakfast. I love you. Huh? Bacon, you know, eggies, all the things. <laughs> huh? Actions. God expresses that also through actions. So he says, I have a passion for you. Now I'm going to manifest the passion that I have for you. The Bible then claims that because of the disobedience of the first parents, something entered to humankind. What entered to us? Not only sin, but because of sin, something enters to us. What is that? Exactly. Death enters to the human history. Before the original sin, we could say that we were created to be right away immortals. We were not going to experience death. We were created with the one that it is, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So we were created for eternal life. But in the beginnings, we fail as a race. We are presented with one temptation. Do not touch the fruit of that tree. Ooh, but it looks juicy. Mm? And if you eat that, you are going to be like God. That was the temptation. So the woman goes, checks, then she calls the husband. All the husbands are obedient, right? So he comes, ooh, nice fruit, and there we go. Death enters. In that moment, the Genesis claims that they realized that they were naked. But the nakedness of them, it is not related at the lack of clothes. The nakedness, it is to realize that, hey, I touched the fruit, I ate the fruit, and I am no God. Mm -mm. I am no God. They discover that they are naked. What was their reaction? To hide, right? To hide. And it still happens. What happens when you sin? Huh? You have the shame and you hide it. You hide it. That is why confession is sometimes so tough. Because you need to unhide the things that you did before. To a stranger, right? The priest. What is the priest going to say to me? Well, that is part of the suffering. If you were having so much fun in sin, now you need to suffer a little bit in confession, right? Telling your stuff. But back to the example of death. So death enters to the human race. And it, in, and it starts having a manifestation in all of us. How do we die? Hmm? Time, past, present, and future, it starts to affect the human race. How were you 40 years ago? Huh? 
In my case, I was blonde, curly hair. Uh, they used to call me Goldilocks. No, that's true. In my college, I hated that name. Now I don't have the Goldilocks. It was 40 years ago. But what happens with time? The body changes, my friends. And we start getting the wrinkles, right? And the vital energy that we used to have that we thought that we were able to cling the entire world, right? Now, we're just trusting a little bit the, uh, the stick, right? Because death, it's passing. Don't get tired. Uh? Because life, it's passing. So death is having a manifestation in yourself. Yes or no? Yes. And finally, in the words of St. Francis of Assisi, the sister death. He calls that like that death. Sister death. He used to call it like that, and it is something funny. I consider that funny from him. He was close to death. So, like in half hour, he's going to die. All the brothers are surrounding him. Oh, St. Francis, don't go. Brother Francis, oh, okay. So finally, in the agony... When a person is in agony, they start seeing things that normal people are not able to see. Priests, for example, since we visit for the anointing of the sick, we are witnesses of things like that. You can find people fighting things and moving hands like this or telling far, I'm seeing things. And, but it's a manifestation, right? So Francis of Assisi, he saw death. He saw death enter into his room. And he says to the sister death, hey, you're late. <laughs> you're late. I've been waiting for you. I need to go back to my creator. That was his desire, you see, the desire of death. So now let's move to the example of the Lord. He comes with a passion, but the passion has an action. It is an action of his love manifesting what we were not able to defeat. How do we defeat death? You and I, have we been able to have a solution for death? Hmm? Do you have like a vaccine and you don't die? Huh? Or do you have a diet and they promise you you're going to be 200 years? Hmm? We don't have nothing. Nothing. We're not able to defeat death. Why? Because that belongs to God. He's the one that makes the call. From ashes you come. To ashes you return. It is a call to him back. So the only one in his passion to be able to defeat death was himself. Do you realize that? So if he is the life, he is the one able to defeat death. So he makes a choice in passion. In passion, he decides that he will experience death. So how could it be that the creator of life it's going to experience death. That is not logical, right? How is death going to say something to God when God has all the tools? Okay, there we go. In faith, we proclaim, I believe that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. In our faith, God doesn't die. But in our faith, we know that Jesus, as a true man, he experienced death. But what is the gain in here? The devil and all the enemies of our salvation, they thought that they were finally getting rid of Jesus. Hmm? That guy is making too many people do goodness. Huh? Jesus is changing hearts. We don't need that. That's the way the enemy thinks. So he thought that he was going to produce death. And then I get rid of him. What he doesn't realize later before the crucifixion, the enemy realizes that it is that by his death, we have been saved. So he dies. And in that moment, death no longer has a power, no longer has the last word. And that is the celebration of Christian life, that we no longer die forever. Instead of that, we enter what I would like to call like the closing of a door and the opening of another door to eternal life. So now 
in that second aspect of the retreat of Lent, we review and we're able to make a good connection with that. So the Lord has a passion for me. And now he pays for me what I was not able to pay back by myself. That is an expression of love. Yes or no? Yes. I have a lame example if you want it. It could be compared to the kid that doesn't have money. Right? You have a son that's still not working. He doesn't have money. But you're giving a car to him. So you're giving to him what he's not able to get yet by himself. Why are you doing that? A manifestation of your love for him. He's paying for us. He's giving that. Now, moving forward. What is the third most important word of Christianity? Resurrection. Resurrection. So we have a passion. We have death. death. Death is defeated. And now we move forward to a word that it is not so easy. Resurrection. Father, how is resurrection going to be? Well, I'm still waiting with you to know how it's going to be. But according to the Bible, it's going to be a total adventure, my friend. Why? Because first of all, death cannot affect you anymore. You will experience death. Yes, as the Lord did. But you will come back to life in his power. And death is not going to handle things anymore. Next, in resurrection, the Lord says that we are going to have a banquet up there. Served by the angels. What is the meaning of that? That we're going to eat, my friends, up there. Right? We're going to have banquet. So if you go to a banquet, what are you going to have? Check the angels. No, food, my friend. Right? So there we go. We come back to life. We share again the meals. But why? Because God likes meals. Review the Bible. A lot of important things, they are happening during meals. How was the liberation of the, of the Israelites from Egypt? During a meal. How was the Last Supper? During a meal. The Eucharist. How was the resurrection when they were in the ocean and they are, hey, that's the Lord. What was he preparing for them? A meal. A fish. He likes meals. So we're going to enjoy that. Third, we are not going to be subjects to distance and time. There is an episode in the resurrection that since the apostles, they were all chickens, right? You remember that they were scared. In my country, my culture, we call chicken the man that is scared of everything. Oh, you're a chicken, right? They were chickens. They closed all the doors and windows because they were afraid that they were, were going to be catched and also to crucifixion. And with an, a house that it was totally closed, what happens? The Lord appears in the mist. So he's not affected any longer by location, space, and distance. So why am I sharing all of this to you? Because those are the joys that are coming. If you don't know what is coming, how are you going to enjoy life? Are you going to submit yourself just to, I have to wake up, brush my teeth, shower, work, eat, sleep, and back again the next day? Are we going to allow the routine to take over? No. The Christianity, it is a life that it is expecting. And in that expectation, it is not a, a family that it is only checking the, the skies to see when Jesus is coming back. No, the angels gave instructions to the disciples. Stop checking the sky. Go to the world and announce what you're having. And that is the Christianity also. People that they have the heart in the proper place. But feet down here, down here, right? And I can say a lot of things to that. I will give you an example from my house. Can I? I remember the time that my mom, my mother, my mom, she started having more conversion in his life. Okay? So she decided that she needs to be in all the masses. Right? So she went to mass at 6 a.m., 8 a.m., 10 a.m. The priest was like, again? Right? Huh? And my dad home, like, my dad is a very calm person. Right? So 
go do whatever you like, right? But then my mom, in all that process, she decided that I need to do vigil, right? And she started arriving home like at 1 a.m. That's the time that it doesn't work, right? We need your feet down here, right? So my dad, that he's a funny guy, he constructed a clock, a watch, a big one. And he took a, a face of Jesus and he cut the face of Jesus and put it as the clock. So face of Jesus and then the hands of the clock, right? And he said to my mom, Jesus needs you here <laughs> in your house. Hungry husband. Huh? Sad kids, right? And I was thinking to myself, who is right? I think that my dad. And I'm the priest, right? So the Lord is telling them, you have a passion. I pay for you. And you expect the resurrection. But resurrection, it is something that happens here in this life, my friends. Resurrection, it is manifested in here. A person that with joy, service, connection to the family shows that the Lord, it is resurrected. Not a person that goes through life like this. Oh, someday I'm going to be happy when the Lord comes. No, now, now it is here. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it's now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. Finally, I will say something more. I used to be in my, in my way of, uh, of teachings kind of a scholar. Do you understand what it, what's that, right? So I need to say the proper words in a humble way. I used to be very intelligent, okay? <laughs> and now I consider myself a total donkey. But it was a lesson that, that God gave me. I went to Rome to study canon law. I'm a canon lawyer. I'm, I'm a lawyer, by the way. Oh, oh Father Ivan, you're so intelligent. Yes. But in that experience of Rome, I was reviewing the life of one more saint that I would like you to consider. And it is Felipe Neri. Filippo Neri. It is an Italian priest, an old one. And this priest, he handled life with simplicity. So what was simplicity? He was sharing and he made his life legacy to adopt all the orphans of Rome. He created a community to feed the poor of Rome, kids without mom and dad. He created all these schools. And these kids, they were basically burglars eh? with knives and stealing people and doing all the harm and all the crazy stuff. How this priest changed the heart of them with simplicity, you see? And I will say it then in the words of, my, of, a, of a phrase from my country. You catch more flies, one drop of honey, than with the barrel of vinegar. Hmm? So that is why, since that time of Rome, I decided I will not preach with a lot of citations and Bible and books and a lot of things to show that I know more than you. I don't care for that. I decided instead of that, that it has to be an experience. That's why, for example, the retreat for Lent, it is only 39 minutes instead of three hours, because I don't believe in long things. I believe instead in things that are proper and to the heart. And I have been praying to God that he gives that gift to all of us. I feel that in my case, since I declare that I'm a donkey, finally the Lord said, yes, you're a donkey, let's work. Because a donkey entered Jesus, to Jerusalem, you see? So the Lord likes donkeys. So if we allow ourselves to be guided by him without complications, without fancy things in life, we're going to make it. 
And we're going to make it in a very good and happy life, my friends. So this retreat, very basic, yes, but it has revelations of that great love of God. So I will test, not test you, but invite you. Consider that. You have heard those words so many times. But try to make a review by yourself, asking the lights of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me to realize that you have passion for me, that you love me. I remember once reading in a message of Jesus saying that if he had to come again, do the same again, only to save one soul, he would do it. That is passion, my friends. That is love from him. And that one could be you. So connect with that passion. Go knowing that he paid all for you so you don't have excuses. I cannot make it. Oh, no, that I cannot pay. No, he already paid for you. It is like heading to fancy vacations. No, I cannot go because I'm ugly. Are you crazy? They already paid for you. You go to the fancy vacations, right? You don't have excuses for anything. The Lord already paid for us. And the resurrection, connection, knowing that we belong to him, knowing where are we heading. So for me, that has been a life changer. And I'm preaching this not only because I have to, and I'm the priest, and I have to say something, but because I believe it. Hmm? And I'm willing to use my life showing that. I hope that you will also in your life. Amen. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it's now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the presence of God, I invite you today, in that wonderful and loving presence of the Holy Eucharist, put your hand for a little bit in your heart. Today that we have shared during the Mass the importance of a good heart, let us ask God that he provides for us, that he cleanses the heart, that he purifies the minds, that he blesses all the environments, all our houses, all our relationships. Today, Lord, in this period of Lent that we are heading, getting close to a holy week, please allow us to recognize your passion for us, Lord. Allow us also to have a good manifestation of our love for you. Help us to deny ourselves in so many occasions. Help us also to take the cross and to follow you. Today also, Lord, we ask you to bless the entire parish, all the members, deceased, and also us, that we are alive with a good spirit to praise you. And we blessed all of us in the holy name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful night. You're fired. I have loved you. What's going on, my friend?